Hi everyone, uh, this is the abbreviated version of the Age of Exploration lecture that we did for, spent a couple of days on earlier this week. And I'm just going to hit the major points here. Um, obviously, if you have additional questions, please always, always, always let me know and I can help you guys out. Uh, first thing that we need to remember is that the Age of Exploration, it's really about the gold god and glory. And gold has to come first. It is really economically based. Uh, we'll be talking after this lecture about mercantilism and the policies of mercantilism by these different European powers that are going to kind of force the age of exploration forward. But the bottom line is these countries view wealth as a zero-sum game. If you are gaining wealth, if you're gaining an advantage in trade, that means somebody else has to be losing it. It can't be a cooperative venture. And for that reason, acquisition of overseas territories is what's going to drive um, that type of economic system forward. And so that is really where the age of exploration comes in. Um, the second thing, the kind of 1A to the one of gold is, is spices. Um, the spice trade is the type of trade that is going on that is driving that economic policy, uh, specifically trade with Asia. And so the whole idea of Columbus is he's trying to find a shorter route to Asia where he doesn't have to um, travel around Africa. He also doesn't have to pay taxes to the various Islamic groups that would run caravans uh, from Asia through the Middle East and into Europe. Um, and the reason why this is uh, happening now is we have economic recovery. So Columbus is 1492. We have economic recovery from the Black Death and the Protestant and Catholic Reformations in terms of Columbus haven't been there yet. Again, 1517 is Martin Luther. But uh, those feelings, those ideas, we talked about the basis that the Reformation has within uh, humanism. That is happening at that point in time. People are starting to look more towards personal experiences. And so those feelings that happen um, are a major element of the Age of Exploration. And once the Reformations do happen, that's really going to play an important role within Europe and in terms of why Europe is going to move forward. Um, we don't need to watch the video, so we'll just move on. Um, the spices, this is just uh, a listing of some of the spices that were found. And really what it's about is uh, access. These spices aren't able to be found all over the place. And as a result, uh, that's going to drive the price of them up. And so if you can find a way to create a colony or create tr specific trading rights within one of these areas, it's going to give you a big advantage over everybody else. And so if you look, for example, cinnamon, this is cinnamon output in 2005. Um, so you can imagine the limited access that would have been around during the time of the Age of Exploration, the 1500s all the way up through the 1600s. So if you can control these areas, you can control these important spices, then you have a, an enormous economic advantage. Um, egg here is just kind of interesting. Um, that it, It's only found on one island, at least initially. And as a result of this, this is actually how the British gained control over Manhattan and New York and and really expand in Northeast uh, America. And it happens because the Dutch actually have that land. Well, they want the nutmeg that the British have on that one island in Indonesia. And as a result, they end up making a trade in 1667. And so we see the Dutch exit North American colonies and we see the British enter those North American colonies. Uh, and you can see just the location of that one specific island where nutmeg was found. The means of exploration, what allows this exploration to happen, um, if we see some change over here. Number one, money. We talked about that, um, the increase in wealth in Europe, um, especially from the uh, aristocracy and especially from the monarchies that are there. Uh, these monarchs are consolidating more and more land than ever before. Uh, we don't see that division that we used to see with feudalism, where you have the lords who are kind of running the deal and lots of local kings. We start to see power consolidated over larger areas. Uh, better ships and uh, learning from better ships and better traders, whether that's Asia or the Middle East, um, taking advantage of the trade that happens after the Crusades to learn and innovate more than ever before. Uh, we see better maps. This map that you see here was mentioned in your textbook. Um, these lines that traverse it, they're actually based on stars, and you can kind of pick out the little stars there that show these locations. Well, the problem is um, they don't account for the curvature of the Earth. So as we start to see maps and cartographers able to account for the curvature of the Earth, that's going to make um, navigation over large distances 
easier and more exact. And that's really what you need if you're traveling long distances and not exactly sure what's going to be there. Um, better technology in a variety of different things. Uh, compasses, the stern post rudder was a big deal. Uh, that rudder you can see here is attached to the ship, so it's no longer freestanding where it could break off or you have a lot of variance. You can kind of set it and forget it. And that's going to allow you to find places more exactly. Uh, we have advancements in the astrolabe, which have been around for a little bit at this point, but it's the early equivalent to the sextant and the latine rig. And that's the last little piece here, the sailboat. I, I'm full disclosure, I'm not a sailor, but from what I understand, uh, it's the idea that no longer are your sails completely fixed in one direction. Uh, you can tack that sail back and forth in order to or you can move the sail back and forth in order to tack your ship, uh, taking advantage of the wind that is there. All of those things kind of combining together are what are really allowing these larger expeditions to take place and for monarchs to fund them and to feel comfortable funding them, that they're going to get return on investment. Uh, in order to do that, again, they have to get gold. Um, Portuguese Empire, Prince Henry the Navigator, he's the guy who creates this school of um, Portuguese sailing. Uh, and initially, what they're looking at is the Gold Coast. That's the western coast of Africa today. Um, Cote d'Ivoire, the Sierra Le Leone, if you've heard the Kanye West song, Diamonds from Sierra Leone, that's what they're talking about there. And there are all these precious jewels and metals that are found there. And that's really like, oh, hey, there are some pretty cool things here. Let's keep going. I wonder what else is there. And so that leads to Bartolomeo Diaz, who's the first European to navigate around the tip of Africa. And then Vasco da Gama kind of builds on that and eventually makes his way all the way over to India. And that's going to eventually lead to some conflict with Muslims. Already, um, we've seen conflict between the two groups. The Muslims controlled North Africa and controlled all the way up into Spain and, and for a long time, about 200 years, uh, ruled over various parts of Spain. Well, that's going to create conflict. And now that the Portuguese, again, on the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula are making their way into traditionally Islamic trading areas like India, um, that conflict rises up again. Now, Portugal has an advantage. Their guns, they have their guns, and they're loaded, and they have more of them. And their armaments on the ships are greatly, uh, are a big advantage over what the Muslims have. And so it's pretty easy for them over the course of the next 20 years or so as they um, make their way um, so we're in the mid-1500s at this point, uh, as they're making their way over to India to start to control what had been Islamic trading posts and are now Portuguese trading posts. So again, it's about expansion for economic purpose. Um, it's not going to stay that way. The Portuguese don't have the manpower to completely colonize these areas. Um, you want to think of it as having basically exact uh, special trading rights within those. Uh, and so, well, this is the same map, but we see Vasco da Gama's voyage to India, and so we see like all kinds of um, little tiny skirmishes in these areas here uh, between the Muslims and the Portuguese. Spanish Empire, Columbus. Uh, you can see the Spanish Empire here, and we'll get to kind of why it is where it is in just a minute, but Philippines out this way, but then North America, South America, Central America, the Caribbean, um, all thanks to Columbus. And when Columbus gets there, um, he starts to instill the policies such as slavery that are going to be such an important part of history of the Americas and the uh, globalization uh, between the Americas and the Europeans. Um, so this is just background information on Columbus. You can kind of read through this on your own. Basically, Columbus is looking for glory. Um, Ferdinand and Isabella, their quote that they give him is really, anything of value, go ahead and bring that back to us. Yeah, thanks. Um, and so for Columbus, he kind of has to deliver on this. Um, there isn't a ton of gold in on the Caribbean islands, and so he has to resort to something else. What's that something else? Well, it ends up being slavery. Um, within about uh, 20 to 60 years, some of these islands in the Caribbean, um, the people who initially inhabited them are completely gone at that point. So to give you an idea of the scope of the policies that Columbus would enact. Um, for Columbus, again, it's not about the Earth was flat, because guess what? The Earth isn't flat. Um, it's also not about that he discovered America, because guess what? He never lands in anything that touches America uh, or that would today be considered a part of America. Uh, but he does land in all these Caribbean islands. You can see his roots here. This is his first voyage 
1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and all that good stuff. Um, it's a month, and again, the, the, the whole idea here is distance. Um, nobody is sure how long it would take to get to Asia, and obviously he never gets there, but he's convinced that he did. And so that's the big deal, and that's what really kicks off the age of exploration. He actually thinks he's over here in Japan, um, insists on calling people Indians, even though some of his crew uh, actually write down that they're pretty skeptical of them. They feel like they might have landed somewhere else instead. But he's like, no, 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 guys, uh, they, trust me, trust me, we made it. These guys just look a little different. It's fine. Um, so you can see he explores all over the Caribbean and even to South America, Central America, um, really does a job in terms of establishing a kind of outpost in the Americas. Um, so the Spanish and the Portuguese are really the two biggest ones. And in 1494, after these initial discoveries, they get together and they're like, hey, maybe we shouldn't fight this out. So they come up with the Treaty of Tordesillas. And this treaty, it's in incredibly gall, um, the, the gall that they have, the guts that they have to do this. They divide the world in half between them and say, all right, any new territories over here, you get them to the Spanish and the Spanish are over here. And for the Portuguese, you get to keep anything over here. And that way we won't have to fight over this land. Um, it's uh, it, it's an especially large amount of hubris in order to say, hey, we're dividing up the world. Um, but they do. And so it tries to limit conflict between the two. You can see uh, the Portuguese would have some of Brazil here today. Uh, and that's why Brazil speaks um, mostly Portuguese as opposed to Spanish like the rest of South America. Um, just background information on the Aztecs. Um, really, the idea is that Hernan Cortez, when he ends up there, it's possible that he's mistaken, not necessarily right on, but to some degree for the uh, Colonel who is headed to return. He kind of, he catches all of these breaks along the way. Um, if the Aztecs had simply attacked him on site, um, we probably wouldn't be talking about Cortez today uh, in the same way that we do, because Cortez eventually does attack and defeat the Aztecs in Mexico. Um, thanks to smallpox, decimating the population, thanks to being initially welcomed in by Moctezuma, thanks to Moctezuma continuously plying him with gold. Um, the second or third time it happens, it's like a, almost like hush money. Okay, here's your gold, go away now, please. But for Cortez, that's just, okay, there's more gold there. I'm going to keep asking for it, and if not, I'm going to imprison you. That's what he does. Eventually, Moctezuma's killed. Um, the fact that they're riding horses and have these huge guns, it's really kind of shock and awe tactics uh, when they get there in the Aztecs. They just, they, they don't really have the opportunity to defend themselves in the way they need to. You can see his route here. Uh, he starts in Cuba and then makes his way over to the Yucatan and finally over here. Um, that is today Mexico City. Uh, this is multiple choice question you can try on your own. Inca, so now we're in South America, modern day Peru and Chile. Um, this is the Andes Mountains, the mountainous region, um, Chichen Itza and Machu Picchu and, the, and those types of places. Cuzco. So if you've seen the Emperor's New Groove, that's what they're talking about here. Uh, it's an empire of wealth, not force, and gold wasn't really valued. So when these Spanish explorers, these conquistadors, um, end up there, it's like, oh, here's some gold, and, and the Spanish conquistadors say, um, this is what I'm here for, and they're thinking, all right, like, take whatever you want, we don't really care. Um, that's really just going to be a power struggle. So for Pizarro, again, smallpox plays an enormous issue. There's a civil war going on, and typically throughout history, um, when people are divided, it makes it that much easier to take them over. But now at this point, they're both, both of these guys are from Spain, uh, so we have huge Spanish influence all over the Caribbean, uh, southern central Mexico. Um, South America, and so the Spanish are really expanding out, and the Spanish are kind of the leaders at this point in time, um, 1520s, 15, into the 1530s, in terms of colonization of these different areas, or at least takeovers, time being. Um, so here is Pizarro's roots, leaving from Panama City, and then ending up down here and making his way around. The slave trade is going to play a super important role um, your textbook does a decent job of this. Um, the idea that it's not just Europeans coming in and taking over, but that African tribes are fighting against each other and will capture prisoners and sell them directly to the Europeans in order to try and make some money. Um, and I'll come back to this in the next segment briefly.